Hello and welcome to the European Resilience Initiative Center video podcast. Today our guest is Fabian Hoffmann. He's a doctoral research fellow at the University of Oslo and an expert in missiles warfare. Welcome, Fabian. Hi, good to be here. Uh, Fabian, during the last two days, or to be more precise, two nights, we have seen uh, two massive missiles attacks of Russia against Ukraine. And the Russians tried to hit uh, infrastructure, first of all, energy infrastructure in Ukraine. But this is not the first mass missile attack um, of Russia against Ukraine. We see the uh, same or similar attacks um, regularly since the last uh, over two years of the war. Do we see now any new patterns or new ways how Russia tries to hit Ukraine? As we see, these last two attacks were much more successful than those uh, before. Yeah, you're, you're correct that um, these attacks have been ongoing for quite a while now. They first started around fall uh, 2022 that Russia started employing missile systems in large scale attacks, initially focused on the uh, critical civilian energy infrastructure of Ukraine in order to destroy and degrade that. Um, and then since then, they've been ongoing essentially with uh, varying intensity. So um, we've seen a, a steady increase then, you know, in 2022 throughout fall and winter, and then it dropped off again um, in spring and summer uh, 2023. And then towards fall and, and winter 2023, um, the intensity increased again. I mean, obviously, this is um, not not random. This coincides with with weather changes and you know how cold it gets, um, and there are obviously also a couple of other factors. Um, and and then actually, for the last one or two months, um, the intensity of these missile attacks kind of decreased again, um, and and now we see them picking up again over the last couple of days. Um, and obviously, the last few nights were um, especially intense com compared to, to previous instances. Um, I, would, I would say, right, in, in terms of targeting, um, Russians kind of changed their tactics um, in late 2023 when we saw them increasingly going not only after energy infrastructure but also industrial targets. Um, right, so with the idea of, of not basically not just punishing the population, but also focusing these missile attacks to systematically degrade Ukraine's capability to arm its forces and, um, and, and, and deploy the necessary infrastructure and industry to, to support the fight. Um, and now, as it appears to me, these last few attacks, again, were heavily targeted against uh, civilian infrastructure targets. Um, so, so we see, right, that they are, they're changing the targets back and forth. I think a lot depends on, on the considerations of, of leadership in Russia on, on the particular days, what, what they believe their priorities are. Um, and obviously there are factors that influence that and I'm sure we're going to talk about that. But, uh, you have uh, explained to um, us already in our previous interview in autumn last year, and I highly recommend uh, everyone to, to watch it when you explain the uh, um, the differences between the Russian missiles, German missiles, British missiles, Taurus, Scalp, Caliber, um, other, um, other missiles. And you have explained how Russia used missiles of different production eras and of different purposes even. Uh, missiles which have been produced to target uh, naval vessels like uh, aircraft carriers in open uh, sea, which are useless practically for precise strikes. Against um, against land targets, but uh, can be an, a weapon of terror. Uh, but um, obviously, even the, uh, compo uh, the composition of these attacks has changed. Uh, Russia is uh, step by step uh, depleting uh, the arsenal of the Soviet-produced missiles, and uh, comes more to newly produced missiles. Is it correct? Yeah, so missile production, obviously, that's a, a huge topic uh, for, for us analysts to figure out. And I would say, uh, without access to, to classified data, um, we can only guess. So it appears that Russia has, over the last one to two years, managed to, to increase its production again. So, so basically what we saw in the beginning of the war, once the sanctions hit, um, there, there was a, a drop. In, in production capacity. And then as the Russian 
defense economy and defense industry adapted, they were able to first bring that back up to pre-war levels and then also go beyond that. So there are some estimates, for example, that uh, prior to the war or the beginning of the war, Russia was able to produce around 60 cruise missiles uh, per month. And now they might have increased that to somewhere around 100 to 120 per month, um, you know, even though there are sanctions. In terms of uh, short-range ballistic missiles, such as Iskander-M, um, previous numbers have spoken of around 5 to 10, so prior to and at the beginning of the war, and now they might be somewhere at 20 to 30 per month. Uh, so so right, in terms of production capacity, uh, again, although we don't know exactly where it is, it, it definitely is the case that it is still there. And, and that Russia is able to produce these missile capabilities in substantial numbers. Um, on top of that, uh, Russia has also made an extraordinary effort to procure missile systems from abroad. So that, that started with the Shahed long-range one-way attack drones that they imported in huge numbers from Iran and that they now also build up a, a, their own production capacity inside Russia. Um, and then they are also interested in procuring short-range and potentially medium-range ballistic missiles from Iran. As far as I know, we, we're not 100% sure yet if this has taken place. My understanding is that it's, it's basically a creed and these missile systems could arrive um, at, at any moment and could be used um, once, once they arrive, but I haven't seen any, any indication that they are all already deployed. Uh, that's, of course, different with North Korean short-range ballistic missiles, uh, which have already been used, so they definitely are, are confirmed instances of Russia employing um, foreign-sourced um, missile capabilities in support of their operations against Ukraine's. Uh, so these are things that come on top of their, their production capacity. So, so overall, right, what, what this all hints to is that um, Russia perceives its missile capabilities as absolutely crucial. Um, they, they play a key role in their campaign against Ukrainian sovereignty. And uh, they go to extraordinary lengths um, and invest heavily in their missile production at home. Uh, but then also invest uh, political and you know, financial capital to, to get additional missile systems from abroad. But isn't it uh, somehow ridiculous that uh, two arch enemies of the West, and in particular of the US, uh, Iran and North Korea, supply Russia with uh, missiles uh, which Russia uses against Ukraine, an ally of uh, the US, and practically Russia allows North Korea and Iran to test their missiles, uh, nuclear-capable missiles, against uh, the US-produced air defense systems. It's, it's practically it's a training, free training ground for the North Korean and Iranian engineers. Yeah, I mean, you know, to be fair, I mean, you, Ukraine, that sense is also a testing ground for, for Western-produced missile defense systems. But I think you're correct in the sense that it's it's really strange that we have enabled um, Russia to freely procure missile systems from our, you know, from from other systemic adversaries that 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 we deal with um, on a, on a daily basis, while we remain extremely hesitant to provide the same type of weapon systems to Ukraine. Um, I mean, in in if there is any sense of reciprocity, right? There should have been missile deliveries long ago. I mean, at the very latest, when we saw confirmed instances of North Korean short-range ballistic missiles arriving in Ukraine and then also being used over there. Um, I mean, this should have been the moment where, where, for example, then the US says, okay, look, if, if Russia is receiving these types of weapon systems from uh, third countries, then, you know, what's stopping us from supplying attack them short-range ballistic missiles uh, to Ukraine. I mean, in the end, right, this is uh, any, any argument then this would induce some escalatory dynamics become increasingly difficult to justify because it's already Russia and, and North Korea that have crossed uh, this threshold. And essentially, in this sense, the West providing the same types of weapon systems would only be a reciprocal action um, so you basically would only move 
at the same speed as your adversary. So, right, I, I don't see how this would be a, a vertical or horizontal escalation in, in any meaningful way. Absolutely, I fully agree. Uh, but what we deliver to Ukraine, and by we, I mean Germany, uh, are mostly the, the air defense missiles. And uh, the German Federal Chancellor regularly announces that Germany is an important supplier for Ukraine and that the skies over Kyiv have been protected by the German missiles, which is true. And I regularly go to Kyiv and every time when I hear explosions in the sky, I know that with a huge chances I may sleep uh, calmly um, if I can sleep during the uh, explosions show uh, because the sky is protected uh, by the German missiles. But at the same time, we don't deliver to Ukraine anything what can prevent such attacks by hitting the launching platforms, etc. Why was the uh, German Chancellor so reluctant in uh, sending Taurus? And um, can Taurus really help, as the Ukrainians say? Yeah, Taurus would have definitely helped. Um, I, I, I think, you know, missile systems are key capabilities in modern warfare. The Russians have understood that. I think the Ukrainians and, and basically everyone else who, who takes you know, defense of their country seriously these days understands that you need long-range strike weapons uh, to effectively fight a war in the contemporary era. Um, and you know, there are many reasons why a Taurus would have been enormously helpful. Um, and the most important, I think, still is that it's, it's simply about the quantity about the, the mass of missile systems that we supply to Ukraine, which they then can put to use. So it's, it's not necessarily about Taurus being, you know, a, a super wonder weapon that can do many great things that Storm Shadow or Scalp Ichi can't, because, uh, you know, as we have talked in our, or, or if, uh, as we have uh, discussed in our, our last uh, session, basically Taurus and Storm Shadow, Scalp Ichi, they're 80 to 90% similar. And, and most of the, the need for Taurus arises from the fact that Ukraine's initial arsenal of Storm Shadow and Scalp EG missiles is slowly but surely depleted. Um, so they just need resupply. Um, so so in, in that sense, Taurus would have been absolutely crucial and needed. Why it has not arrived, I think it, it fundamentally relates to, to a deep fear of angst um, in the Chancellery. Um, so the, the fact that this war could escalate, um, that Germany could be drawn into the war, which means that the NATO would be drawn in, into a wider conflict, which then would see the, the risks of escalation increase drastically, potentially even to the nuclear level. And I think this is really something that this, this fear is what guides the chancellor and the chancellor is not willing to take any risks. Um, and you know, like I'm, I mean, the, the thing is, right, with, with Taurus deliveries, I, I agree with the Chancellor in the sense that, you know, I, I, even I, right, I, I'm 100% I'm sure, um, well, that would be, no, not a 100%, but I'm, I'm almost certain, right, that if Germany delivered Taurus, nothing would have changed, nothing would have happened. Um, but sure, you know, from my perspective, I can't guarantee that. I, I can't 100% tell that this is not going to cross some Russian red line and they will take some escalatory action in, in response. So I, I agree with the Chancellor in the sense that there is a risk, right? I think this risk is really, really minimal, um, but yes, there is a risk. But what, what the Chancellor and I think what more broadly our Western decision makers desperately need to understand is that right now in the situation that we're in, there are no risk-free decisions. Um, risk is not, a, is not a bug in the game that we're playing. It, it really is a feature, right? It's a function of, of what we're doing here. Um, you cannot minimize, or, or you cannot minimize risk to the extent in the situation that we're in right now, um, that they're completely nullified. But this is essentially what the Chancellor wants. The Chancellor would only be willing to supply Taurus if there would be zero risks attached, and this is just not possible. Um, and even though, you know, like these risks are really, really minimal and there would be many things that, like many steps Germany could have taken together with the Ukrainians to minimize such risks, um, such as like, let's say, geofencing or, you know, political promises from Ukraine to not target specific types of, of areas. Um, this is just not something that the Chancellor does not want to accept. 
Um, and that's in the end why, why deliveries did not happen. So it's a, it's a deeply political decision. It has nothing to do with the technical characteristics of Taurus. It has nothing to do with, with any legal requirements. Um, in the end, this is, is about the, the political decision making in Berlin and the political unwillingness of the chancellor and his party. Well, but uh, we know that uh, making it clear for Putin that uh, threatening us with escalation leads to our passivity and uh, uh, to our like non-help in Ukraine or helping only to a certain extent just encourages Putin to uh, threaten us with more escalation. So by, by having fear of Putin going, uh, going in some sort of rampage, uh, we are just uh, provoking him to threaten us more. That is actually not a game which uh, one can win with escalatory rhetoric. But uh, if we go back to uh, what you've mentioned with the air defense systems, we have seen in this war between Russia and Ukraine that uh, to a certain extent, some areas in Ukraine remain for a longer time uh, almost 100% protected, like Kyiv, for example. Only very few Russian missiles could pierce through uh, the, the air defense, and most the damage which came to Kyiv were from the debris, from the uh, drones or missiles which have been shot down. Only very few missiles really hit the, um, the territory of Kyiv. But now we see it's different, as the Russians, uh, from the last attack, the last wave attack, I think one third of missiles, about uh, 50 of missiles and drones hit their target, not in Kyiv, in other cities. Do we see some change of patterns in attack, like attacking unprotected targets? Or do we see that uh, also, in addition to that, the Ukrainian air defense is being depleted? Yeah, it's probably a mixture of a, a couple of factors. Um, so it, it probably is just the, the intensity of the attack. So the amount of missile systems that come in uh, from different directions, from different trajectories, right? I mean, we see that these are really multi-vectorial attacks um, with cruise missiles, short-range ballistic missiles, drones, repurposed air-to-surface missiles that all fly different trajectories. Um, and so that's, that's obviously right, like a more challenging type of attack to, to intercept um, than, than if you have, are just attacked by, by cruise missiles, for example. But then again, yeah, we, we saw in the past that, that the missile defense system in Kiev or the missile defense shield um, around the city has, has been able to deal with that very effectively. So, so there must be other factors. Um, I mean, it could be that the Russians managed to adapt in some way. Right? There, there could be that they um, managed to, to um, you know, re, redo some of the, um, or, or, or adapt the, the flight path in a way, or, or let's say in terms of electronic warfare systems, um, making them more resistant. I mean, just speculating here, right? But I mean, um, war is a constant game of adaptation on both sides. So it's not unthinkable that the Russians um, did some measures to implement some measures to increase the, the effectiveness and making it more effective specifically against the types of missile defense systems that we're seeing around Ukraine um, and, and, and Kiev in particular. Um, and then, yeah, it, it could also be that uh, the missile defense systems around Kiev are slowly but surely being uh, depleted. I mean, we, we see, for example, um, th that, that could be because specific launchers have been destroyed because um, uh, because ammunition is not arriving at the speed that it has to, meaning that uh, missile defense operators have to prioritize which types of, of targets to engage and, and which ones to deliberately let slip through because they just cannot engage all of them at the same time. Um, it, it could also be right that we've seen Ukraine uh, redeploying some assets closer to the front line, either to, to strike Russian aircraft or, or perhaps also to react to the, to the new threat of, of Clyde bombs that really has been emerging in the last couple of months. Uh, so, yeah, no easy answers, right? And without access to classified information, we, we can't, of course, um, provide definitive answers to, to why these attacks have been more successful. But probably it's a, it's a mix of several factors that have, a played, have played a role. 
Uh, what is the sign of the competition between the number of entire all defense or uh, entire air air defense missiles uh, to be produced in the West and the number of Russian cruise missiles and drones being produced in Russia and Iran? Yeah, I don't have perfect insights there into into production numbers on on the Western side. I, I would say right now um, it, it would appear to me that probably Russia can produce faster on the offensive side than the West can produce on the defensive side, um, and that's obviously the case if we if if the the US um, falls away as an as an ally and as a partner that continuously supplies Ukraine. I mean, just look at, at Patriot, right? Uh, Germany is building up now a, a production line for PAC-2 GMT interceptors um, in Schrobenhausen with, with MBDA Germany. Uh, but that will take still, I think, a year or two to come online and then you know another t year or two until the first uh, interceptors uh, are, are completed. So right now, when it comes to Patriot, literally there's only one supplier um, for newly produced systems, and that is the U.S., everything else just comes from existing stocks. And so now that the U.S. is not uh, has not been delivering military aid for a couple of months, um, at least at a consistent pace, um, sure, you know there there is a there is an increasing likelihood that Ukraine is running increasingly short of these crucial interceptors. Uh, just because there there are not enough interceptors in existing stocks in Western states um, that could compensate for the lack of of newly arriving interceptors that come from the United States. So this is yeah obviously very very problematic. Um, and then if you if you look at other systems, so Iris T for example, um, deal in Germany has also drastically increased uh, production. Same with MBDA France by the way for for Aster 30 and Aster 15 for Sam T. Um, you know, so steps are taken, but it's just because we, we took two years to really start scaling up production in the West. This is now just coming too late. And then especially with the bottleneck that is created by the US um, not, not delivering now what it has in the past. Yeah, this is a, a very problematic situation, I would say. And what about the uh, the missiles, interceptors, uh, which are already on stock in other countries? We have seen this initiative by uh, the uh, Czechian president, uh, General Pavel, uh, who has found like at least 800,000 of artillery shells uh, available uh, for uh, for Ukraine to be like to be sold to Ukraine. Um, can we find uh, something like that in stocks um, in the warehouses of the nations which use Patriot systems? Yeah, I mean, the, the problem here is that uh, Patriot interceptors are just not available in the numbers uh, when it comes to, yeah, compared to, to 155 millimeter shells. Uh, you know, another obvious candidate with a large stockpile of Patriot interceptors, same as with artillery, is South Korea. I mean, you know, South Korea, unsurprisingly, because it is one of the few countries in the West that over the last two to three decades has not completely uh, stopped believing in the, the likelihood of a major war breaking out and preparing for that. Uh, so yeah, they, they would have quite substantial stockpiles of Patriot interceptors. But then, you know, also understandably, uh, from their perspective, they are probably very reluctant um, to provide that to Ukraine, given the constant threat that they are, are facing from North Korea, right? I mean, same when, when I get asked, like, hey, why is South Korea not just delivering Taurus cruise missiles? Because they also have them. I mean, they could, but, but Taurus, and, and that's the same for Patriot, really, um, these systems play a key role in their deterrence strategy vis-a-vis North Korea, right? Like the idea is that if if push ever comes to shove and a North Korean nuclear strike is imminent, um, no, South Korea would try to preemptively destroy North Korean nuclear launchers and then intercept whatever is left with their missile defense systems. And yeah, for, for this task, they need Taurus and they need Patriot. So I understand why they would be really, really hesitant to, to deliver larger numbers of Patriot interceptors to Ukraine. Um, and then beyond that, uh, yeah, states just have not procured in the numbers that they should have, especially in the West. Um, 
Also not sure, you know, like in the Middle East, how uh, there are some Patriot operators. I'm not sure how willing they would be, um, either for political or military reasons. Um, so yeah, this this really is a, is a product that is characterized by by scarcity, unfortunately. Uh, can Ukraine uh, now get like more different air defense uh, systems, like from other countries? There have been talks about Ukraine getting like um, air defense systems from Spain, from other countries which are neither Patriot uh, nor IRST uh, nor else from the Norway. Um, is it possible for Ukraine to expand its in addition to their land forces zoo, as the minister Reznikov called uh, many types of tanks and IFVs, which Ukrainian army is using, uh, create an air defense zoo, investing in uh, as much different types of air defense as possible. I mean, in the end, everything helps, right? Um, so, so whatever the West has and, and can be spared, I think, should be sent to Ukraine. Uh, I, I don't know how many new systems... Um, there would be that are not already deployed uh, in Ukraine right now. I mean, the, the key missile defense systems that are used in, in NATO states uh, for the for the short uh, and, and medium range spectrum um, is, is Patriot, it's NASAMS, it's IRIS-T, uh, and, and you, you already see them, right, deployed in, in Ukraine. I mean, beyond that, if you, if you go to, to higher range systems, um, that could be, could be an option. Um, but, but then, you know, there's also the question, um, what, what added benefit uh, does it provide? Because these weapon systems are really then, then built uh, towards intercepting longer range kind of threats, uh, which Russia is not deploying at the moment. I mean, really, right, the key issue for, for Ukraine are short range ballistic missiles and, and then also um, Kinchal, which technically is a medium-range ballistic missile, but given that it, it does not um, leave the atmosphere for too long, its flight profile um, really approaches more that of a short-range ballistic missile, so it, it can easily be, or it, it can be read, readily intercepted by, by Patriot, right? So, so if, you then, if you then deploy like something like THAAD or, or you know, let's say Arrow or something, like a, a system that is optimized against medium-range threats, uh, you could do that, but, but I'm afraid, you know, there's just not the, the threat environment that would warrant this kind of deployment. So, so I would really say, I, I mean, focus on the ones that Ukraine has, because they have also proven really, really effective. They have proven that they are capable of dealing with the threat that Russia is presenting. Again, what we in the West need to do much more than we already do, um, much more drastically, is just increase production capacity for the launchers, for the radars, for the interceptors. Um, and especially in Europe, right, if, if the United States, I mean, I've, I've said that in the past, right now, the United States, even under President Biden, it's not a reliable partner anymore, unfortunately, um, given that it has a Congress that can be held hostage by um, a small number of Republicans. Uh, so, so it's completely incomprehensible for me why, why in Europe um, we, we're not realizing how desperate the situation is and how much more we need to increase production. Uh, because theoretically we could do so, we just politically choose not to. Absolutely, uh, but um, talking about the uh, launch platforms, uh, the Russians use like mostly, if we don't count the S-300 air defense uh, systems, which the Russians use also for attack yeah. on land targets. The Russians use mostly either naval platform for launching missiles like caliber missiles, or are there airplanes? And here we have like strategic bombers, uh, Tupolev uh, 95 or Tupolev 160, or the interceptor uh, like MiG 31 for launching of Kinzhal missiles, and the glide bombs, which you have mentioned, which have been launched from Suhoi 24 or Suhoi um, 34, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so uh, the, the Russian power of hitting Ukraine uh, with missiles is based on like the, the naval component and the aerial component. After the Ukrainians have forced the Russian fleet to hide in the harbors of, of the eastern port of the Black Sea, can Ukrainians go uh, intensively after the strategic bombers and try to uh, hit Russia here? to prevent Russians from launching their missiles from the strategic bombers? 
Yeah, so I mean, you know, I think that is the most morally bankrupt decision of Western decision makers uh, when it comes to the, the missile domain. That we uh, basically tell the Ukrainians, hey, um, it's, it's okay if you intercept um, Russian missiles as they are inside your airspace, but under no circumstances are you allowed to, to destroy the launchers um, inside Russia. I, I don't see right like how this is morally justifiable. I think it is it is very reprehensible um, in in my opinion. And again, I, I do understand the argument associated with risks and escalation risks. Um, I'm not saying that they are zero, um, but again, uh, risk is a is a feature, not 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 a bug of the game that we're playing. Um, and and I would say you know enabling Ukraine to to engage Russian launchers inside Russia, which are Right, purely military targets, uh, they are usually also not co-located or co-mingled with civilian infrastructure. Um, I, I think that, is the, that risk is absolutely worth it. And, and we, we must, in fact, enable Ukraine to do that, because otherwise I, I don't see how, how Ukraine should be able to deal with this missile threat uh, effectively. And, and, and to do so, right, like if, if that political decision is, is taken um, to, to supply these kinds of weapon systems and also lift, to lift targeting restrictions, um, yeah, you would also have to deliver um, long-range weapon systems that can reach uh, these launchers. And I don't have a perfect overview where exactly those, those Russian bases are. Um, I, I would say with, with something like a, a Taurus, right, which has a, a range of, of higher than 500 kilometers, probably up to seven to 800, um, or, or with something like a Chasm ER that could be delivered together with F-16, you would have a very high likelihood of, of at least reaching um, quite a few of those air bases uh, and, and naval ports to degrade Russia's launcher capability. And as Russia doesn't produce strategic bombers anymore, at least no Tupolev 95 bombers anymore, and very few numbers of Tupolev 160 has been produced um, during the last decade. Uh, this will significantly decrease the uh, amount of missiles Russia may launch in one wave and increase the, uh, the, the, uh, the usage of the infrastructure itself. So you cannot have the same bomber flying constantly for, for decades, and they are flying already for decades. So yes, it would be a solution to at least reduce the pressure from the Russian side on the Ukrainian on the Ukrainian air defense. Uh, do you see any uh, chances for Ukraine to win this war against the Russian missiles attacks, uh, given that there will be no significant change in numbers of ammunition um, platforms or no different uh, weapon systems will arrive to Ukraine? Well, I think now that um, it's, it's pretty clear, right, that Germany is not going to deliver Taurus, uh, France and the UK, they're pretty much depleted their own stocks of Storm Shadow Skull PG that they can provide to Ukraine. Um, there's no indication that missile systems are coming from, from the US um, for, the, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and again, right, I'm, I'm very happy to be surprised and to be proven wrong. And, and I'm tremendously happy if these decisions are reversed. Uh, but I think it's it's sensible to just um you know uh, approach this in in terms of the worst case scenario that appears to have uh, manifested itself um so so what are the alternatives i think then the alternative really is to enable ukraine's own uh, missile industry and we've seen over the last couple of weeks that actually long range drone strikes by ukraine against uh, russia's oil infrastructure have been very, very effective. So you, right, this is basically proof of concept that there is an industrial base capable of producing long-range strike weapons. Um, I have heard from, from, from contacts that, um, right, compared to, to building up this long-range strike industry, the missile industry is facing a, a range of obstacles. Um, mostly when it comes to scaling, right? I mean, Ukraine also has proved that it can uh, produce Neptune anti-ship cruise missiles that also have been used, uh, that has been used first to, to destroy the Moskva cruiser, uh, but then also have been used in land attack roles against S-400 batteries. So again, right, proof of concept that Ukraine can do this, but what they're struggling with apparently is scaling production. 
Um, so basically what they're doing right now with their cruise missiles, they're pretty much building them by hand, um, validating them by hand. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's, it's a process that takes a very long time. Um, and I think, right, the least that the West can do is if we do not provide these missile systems ourselves, we should put a massive effort behind helping Ukraine scaling their own industry. And I think that's possible. Um, you could also do so in many ways, right? I mean, the most straightforward thing, for example, would be, hey, if the Ukrainians are struggling, let's say, with turbojet production, um, right, the, the, the jet propellant system that, uh, that, that propels uh, the, the cruise missile, um, you have Safran, which is a, a French turbojet producer that could pro send those individual components if you're not willing to deliver the whole missile system. Um, if you say that even that is too politically sensitive, I mean, you, you could also just send people from MBDA Germany, from MBDA France, um, under a civilian mission or something like that to Ukraine uh, to, to help them streamline processes, maybe help them overcome technical bottlenecks and barriers. I mean, there really are options, right? Um, Germany could deliver the types of precision uh, machining tools that are, by the way, used right now in North Korea um, to develop uh, and, and produce their ballistic missiles. I mean, Germany didn't deliver them directly, but they delivered them to China, and China forwarded those precision machining tools to North Korea, right? Um, so, so there are options, right? And you why don't just have, just have Siemens, for example, in Germany, deliver a couple of precision machining tools to Ukraine? Um, I, I think, again, there are options, and, and I do not understand why we haven't started this process a year or two ago, uh, but given that the best moment to do so was yesterday, the second best moment is, is today. And, and I think this is really now where we perhaps should, should focus our attention and effort. Well, of course, there are many options to support Ukraine. We know that Russia buys also uh, German-produced and U.S.-produced equipment uh, for the high-precision uh, tunes, cutting tools or uh, like drilling tools to produce there military equipment and they are buying them either directly or which is more often via the third countries why don't we send to ukraine uh, the same machinery via the third countries like the russians buy nitrocellulose from germany via turkey why don't we sell all the same equipment or the same raw materials to ukraine via turkey it's absolutely legal and it would not be like uh, an additional escalation as you said we will be moving in the same speed um with the same speed like our um advisory um it was fabian hoffman who is a doctoral research fellow at the university of oslo and we were talking about the chances of ukraine to win the war against the russian missile attacks and how good is the ukrainian air defense prepared for this fight thank you fabian for your interview and for your insights yeah thanks so much for the invite and don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel. And if you have any ideas, leave them under this video as your comment. See you soon during our next interviews.